fans, welcome back to the Fan Master Report, a weekly podcast covering the business of celebrity that fans want in on. I'm your host, Jessa Moye, a fellow fan and investor. So, what a shark of a week. The billionaire race is on. Soros is buying the dip. Subway is getting a much talked about makeover. And the Golden Derby has begun as Emmy nominations were announced this week. Tara Reid and Ian Ziering are back on Discovery, verifying the possibility of a real shark NATO. And Whale Shark has a whale of an NFT collection. Social fiends are striking up serious cases of wanderlust and fan FOMO from the south of France, and celebrities are striking striking a pose in Cannes. Later in the show, we have interviews with some of the French Riviera Film Festival 2021 award-winning directors, filmmakers, and finalists. I'll be hosting the virtual awards ceremony live from the legendary Beverly Hills Hotel later today, actually, and we'll share a very special coverage on next week's episode of the FanBester Report. Crypto fans around the world are preparing for the flippening. Bitcoin has long been king, but in years since Ethereum's 2015 arrival, the second biggest cryptocurrency has been gaining ground via innovations from DeFi to NFTs, leading fans to claim that ETH could one day overtake BTC in market capitalization. And talk about diamond in the rough. This past weekend, Sotheby's auction house made history with the most expensive piece of jewelry to be sold in crypto. They auctioned off a 101.38 carat diamond for 12.3 million of ether or Bitcoin. Sotheby's mentioned that it was all in the name. The diamond is known as the key 10138 to celebrate its enlightening virtue while also alluding to the crucial function of digital keys in the world of NFTs and cryptocurrency. Crypto and NFT heavyweight Whale Shark is the collector and founder of Whale and has started to swim with Sound Ventures, Gaio Siri, and Ashton Kutcher. They are now diving deep into NFTs. It was recently announced that with a $1 million investment, they're teaming with Mark Cuban and Snoop Dogg to launch NFTs, The Pitch, with the Shark Tank twist. Since 2009, Shark Tank has become one of America's favorite reality television series. Entrepreneurs pitch the panel of judges known as Sharks with a background in business and venture capital. The panel has a net worth of over $5 billion combined. These Sharks are paid as cast members of the show, but the money they invest with is their own. According to data, some of the Shark Tank business has made more than $150 million in sales, and the biggest whale of them all is the infamous Scrub Daddy. Sharks are an important part of the ecosystem in economics and in entertainment. In fact, there are around 140 different species of sharks, and the chances of being bitten by a shark are one in four million. So in reality, not just TV, you would probably have a better chance of getting a million dollar investment from one of those sharks than actually being shark bait. That said, these beasts have spawned a serious obsession from fans. Universal Pictures has made 472 million off the box office smash hit Jaws alone. The shark franchise is still making a profit today through their merchandise that you can purchase obviously online or in movie like stores and a few film studios. This supports the fact that Jaws is the biggest blockbuster movie of the 20th century. Sharknado is the ultimate shark film series though. Directed by Anthony C. Ferrante, the Sharknado had a budget of $2 million and it had a total gross over the four year franchise that's now worth $4.5 billion. This was a one in a billion type of thing. With no marketing budget, it was a shark fan's word of mouth and social shares that drove sales of this huge franchise. The FanBester social team pulled the fans on their favorite shark franchise. Jaws vs. Sharknado? Jaws was the winner. Open Water vs. The Shallows? Close call, but fans would rather be in open water. Celebs are getting up close and possibly a little too personal with the sharks in Discovery's 33rd annual Summer Shark Salute. With a record number of hours of programming, fans will fill their shark of an appetite with Johnny Knoxville, Tara Reid, Ian Ziering, and Tiffany Haddish. While her fantasy was to uncover the secrets of shark sex, sailing on the fanciest yachts surrounded by the friendly sea creatures and pampered by handsome mermen, she was actually joined by Dr. Toby Daly Ingle and a team of researchers for a very sharky wake-up call. So, why should fans watch? Haddish said she learned that female sharks don't have it easy out there, but 
but they stick together. Coming up next, fans will hear straight from Dr. Toby Engel, her co-star, the director of the Florida Tech Shark Conservation Lab, on how fans can make a good investment with heart. I'm told by so many people that I couldn't do certain things, and it never is. You just gotta do it. Hey fans, welcome back. It's Shark Week, and we are here with the expert, Dr. Toby Daly Engel. Hi, doctor. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us. And by the way, congratulations on Shark Week. Thank you, my favorite week. Your favorite week, yes. Okay, so we know the special with Tiffany Haddish premiered on July 11th. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, that was a really exciting introduction to shark sex, which is not something I think we talk about on Shark Week a lot. You know, it's a lot more shark attack. Um, and this was really fun for me. I talk about shark sex all the time. So to get to talk about it with Tiffany Haddish was just amazing. You know, there was some interesting insight though that Tiffany learned while doing this. And it, that was about the female experience uh, within the waters and being a shark. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, well, shark reproduction is, as you might imagine, fairly different from ours, but not as much as people would think. Sharks actually have internal fertilization, just like humans, which means they need sex organs, just like humans. So the males have penises, but actually they have two penises and they call them claspers. And when a shark wants to mate, a male will slash and bite at the female to signal to her. And in sh sharks are fish and in all fish, the females are actually bigger. And so she could pretty much eat the male if she wanted to. Um, and so most of the time, males and female sharks of every species actually separate themselves to avoid mating because it can be kind of rough for the female. But turns out the female sharks have this amazing adaptation where their skin is actually really thick compared with the male in order to cope with that behavior, that slashing and that biting behavior. Um, and we're not really sure why females choose to mate with certain males, but we know a lot of the time they're trying not to mate. Mm, very interesting. Now, this isn't your first appearance on Discovery Shark Week. Tell us a little bit about your history with it. Well, um, back in 2016, I was featured online as one of the women of Shark Week, but my first special wasn't until 2018, um, and that was exciting. It was Shark Week's 30th anniversary, and the show was called Great White Shark Babies. And so we were looking into the reproductive behavior of mama white sharks and trying to figure out where they were giving birth. So... Here today, uh, this year on Shark Week, we were talking more about bulls and tiger sharks and reef shark mating, but it's all kind of the same question. Hmm. Such a powerful thing, you know, the power of, of sharks, right? And so many people have become not only, you know, afraid of these great beasts, but fans of these great beasts. What is it about sharks, do you think, that has really, you know, become a fan favorite? Well, I think that Shark Week has been around for a long time. I know I grew up watching Shark Week. So things like having that presence in the media, that's not something like a movie like Jaws or something else that sows fear. Shark Week has always been kind of insight into, well, not always, but sometimes about the science and gives people a little bit of, of different access. But I think simply because people know that they're out there and that they're potentially dangerous gives us a kind of fascination. And most people haven't actually seen a shark, maybe in an aquarium, most of the time not in the wild. And so there's this kind of air of mystery, like they're big, they're mean, and they can come out of nowhere. And so Shark Week is actually pretty good. And, and National Geographic, Shark Fest, these are the programs where we're really trying to demystify the sharks and say, look, here they're not these faceless, mindless predators. They're actually really, really cool animals with a lot of different complex behaviors and a lot of similarities to people that you might not have heard of before. 
So how would you tell shark fans to invest in order not only to protect their their wildlife, um, but you know, protect the sea in general? That's a really good question because we know that even though people tend to be scared of sharks, shark attack itself is super rare. And sharks as predators are really important to the marine ecosystem health. Sharks are kind of in charge of helping to keep all the other prey species in balance. They weed out the sick ones and the old ones and function kind of like lionesses on the plains of Africa. You know, they don't go after the biggest, fastest gazelles. They're going after the weaker ones. And that really keeps the whole population healthy. So without sharks, the whole ocean suffers. All of those different prey species can literally eat themselves out of all of their resources and then those starve. And so an area without sharks soon won't have any fish at all. So even if people aren't fans of sharks, you know, people in general want a healthy ocean. And so investing in the health of sharks actually reaps rewards throughout the entire marine ecosystem. And so I think there's probably uh, two or three really big ways that people can invest. Obviously, financially, there's a lot of different institutions that you can support that are doing really, really amazing shark research that contributes to conservation. Another thing that people can do is just get involved in anything that promotes ocean health. You know, if you live by the beach and you walk, do a beach cleanup and, and help pick up trash one day, that's having an effect on shark populations. If you donate money to an established nonprofit that works on the ground with shark conservation, that's gonna have a difference. Supporting legislation that funds uh, ocean research or that protects fish populations, same idea. Thank you for that. We super appreciate your insight and your time. Please remind the fans where they can continue to find, follow, uh, and invest in any of the projects or nonprofits that you're involved with. Well, I am the director of the Shark Conservation Lab, and so I'm available um, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Daily Angle Lab, and you can find a link to support our research. We are a registered nonprofit, and all of the funds donated to the lab go to the students that actually conduct the research, and especially uh, unrepresented groups in marine science, primarily women, especially women of color. So you can go to at Daily Angle Lab and find a link to donate, and uh, we really appreciate it. Ah, there you go, shark fans. Invest with your heart. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelby. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Fans, keep it here. We've got more coming up next. Welcome back to the FanVesta Report. While fans and sharks of all kinds have been busy in the sea on screen this week, back on dry land, it's a season of fashion and film. It's the third annual French Riviera Film Festival, recognizing and celebrating short form content created for film, television, web, and all digital platforms. In the glamorous South of France setting, the French Riviera Film Festival invites filmmakers from around the globe to participate in the two-day festival that includes screenings, award ceremonies, and a closing gala party. The French Riviera Film Festival places a spotlight on the best short films content during the same time period as the Festival de Cannes. It was created by co-founders Nicole Mouge and Gotham Shanda. Attendees and participants will include filmmakers, industry executives, celebrities, media, and influencers. Tonight, we will celebrate virtually live from the legendary Beverly Hills Hotel. But first, we wanted fans to hear straight from the filmmakers and finalists themselves. Our first interview is with award-winning Bertrand Norman, producer of Taste of Ginger and Iskra, a sci-fi. He's also the director of Ballerina, a TV movie documentary available now on Amazon Prime Video. Let's take a look at this. <laughs>
совсем скоро. Это может произойти в любой день. Я поняла это потому, как люди на меня смотрели. Welcome back to the Fan Vesta Report. I am so excited to be here with the acclaimed filmmaker Bertrand Normand today. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Hello, congratulations on the success of your films in the French Riviera Film Festival. Both Taste of Ginger and Iskra have been nominated and are finalists. How are you feeling? Well, I feel great because uh, these are two films that we've been working on a lot. Uh, the Taste of Ginger, we started that project uh, nearly three years ago and uh, it was a, a long time to get the funding and to um, get the film in place and uh, then the COVID uh, started and we had to postpone the shoot um, and eventually we shot the film and uh, then the post-production. I mean, the whole process was a long one, but um, I think the result completely justifies these efforts. And uh, the French Riviera Film Festival is the first festival to which, uh, in which this film uh, got selected. And it's the first award that it got. So it's very something to remember. And uh, Iskra is, uh, is a project that um, uh, was, was, was made like uh, more quickly, but with a tremendous uh, gathering of energies. We did that in the framework of a competition in Russia. Um, we had seven days to film and edit the film, and part of it was shot in France, part of it was shot in Russia, and within seven days we had like two units, one in, one in France, one there, and uh, we had to work very quickly, but I think that in the end it's a very polished film, 
very well crafted, and I'm proud to have been the producer. It seems almost impossible to complete any sort of film project within seven days. Congratulations. What attributed to that success and being able to accomplish the almost seemingly impossible? Well, one has to be very prepared. Um, one has to think about all the details, all the little uh, steps in advance. Like um, the music needs to be scored in advance. Uh, the actors need to be uh, prepared, need to prepare themselves in advance. They need to know their parts very well. Um, all the technical aspects, uh, the photography, the sound, everything has to be put in place in advance. And, and once everyone is prepared, and the, 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 the magic of these kind of projects is that people feel the, the, the need to, to, to do their best, and they feel the pressure and it really increases their capacity and it increases the teamwork. And as a result, it is possible. Incredible. Well, very well done. Here at Fanbester, we talk a lot about the fans. I'm wondering who and what you are a fan of that's really contributed to your style and success as a filmmaker. Um, I'm a fan of several filmmakers uh, throughout the history of uh, filmmaking. I'm a fan of Stanley Kubrick and Alfred Hitchcock, mm -hmm. among others, especially these two uh, uh, directors, and probably I could say uh, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, who is an Italian, a famous Italian director, and Luchino Visconti as well. These filmmakers have really influenced me a lot. They have probably shaped somehow um, what I could consider as my style. And um, I watch their films often. And whenever I watch their films, I get ideas, I get impressions. And, I, and it's, it's um, an infinite source of uh, inspiration. Uh, now, a lot of it is unconscious. And I think that when I write a script, when I direct a film, uh, most of um, my ideas are probably influenced in a way or another in an unconscious way. But I'm sure that these filmmakers in particular have uh, had a great impact on uh, my inner world and on how I want to tell stories. What is your mission or your statement as a director? Um, my, my mission as a director is to uh, convey uh, certain emotions, certain experiences to the audience, um, some parts of my life which I think uh, have a certain value and, uh, ha and, 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 are, and deserve to be shared, to share my understanding of certain things, to share the utter emotions I felt in certain cases. I think that filmmaking is a great tool to convey experiences and emotions. And um, I also feel a great responsibility being a filmmaker um, as to how to convey this and how the viewer is going to take this. So um, I respect the viewers a lot. And I think that a lot of efforts should be put in every single film even if it takes years, because then a film, the life of film can, can be much longer than the time during which it was made. That is so powerfully said. The film lives on, and so does your legacy as the filmmaker, really. What is it that you want to be known for? What is your legacy? Um, the, the, the films, especially the fiction films, that I've worked on, but also the documentaries to some extent, have something to do with um, the dance between the objective reality and the reality that each of us creates for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's one of the greatest challenges of any human being to somehow um, create a reality that has to do with the objective reality. Uh, sometimes, uh, we want to create something that is more beautiful than the objective reality. And sometimes the challenge is to understand it 
in order to avoid catastrophes. So I think that every each of my films has to do with that theme, whether it's comedies or fantasies or thrillers. Uh, I always deal with this dance, with this fight, with this uh, conflict between objective reality and the, the reality which we create for ourselves. And I think that if I manage to tackle this theme um, thoroughly enough and to help the viewers understand something which can be valuable for their own life, then I will have fulfilled something. So powerful. You, you mentioned the dance, and I'd like to know more about Ballerina on that note, oh. a TV documentary that is available on Amazon Prime right now. Yes, Ballerina uh, is a documentary film which I made already quite a while ago, years ago in Russia. It's about ballerinas from the Kirov Ballet in St. Petersburg. Because the thing is that at the time when the Soviet Union existed, and the Iron Curtain was there, uh, people in the Western world knew very little about the Soviets, you know? All we knew about was the, the Red Army, the ballet dancers, and the musicians. Uh, and both ballet and classical music were somehow the window of the Soviet Union, you know, something that was um, very powerful, some very well crafted and great artists and great uh, stagings. And there were tours of uh, uh, ballet troops from Moscow and Leningrad in Europe, in the United States. So this was the window. So my question was, once the Iron Curtain fell, fell what about this window? Like, is it still, does it still exist or is, is it no longer a window? And what about these artists? So I wanted to know more about that. And I went to St. Petersburg, I explored the world of ballet, and I was so much so inspired by it that I decided to uh, direct a documentary about ballerinas, about several ballerinas who were at different stages of their career and who all of them together could actually uh, uh, present what the life of a ballerina is. So uh, it took three years to make this documentary, and I did. I, I shot it with a very small camera. I, I had no idea that anyone could be interested in this uh, later on. I just wanted to film this. That was my only motivation. But then, once the film existed, it was released everywhere. And first of all, it was uh, selected in many festivals. And then it was released in movie theaters in various countries. It was broadcast on TV. It was uh, then on platforms. It was sold on DVDs and Blu-rays up to now. So I, I was the first one surprised by the, the extent, you know, of, uh, of uh, the success of this film. And, and I, was, I was amazed that it could uh, uh, tell something to people. And then I understood, I understood what my mission was and what my responsibility was. Hmm. It's clear that you've invested so much time and to tell these stories, right? To honor that responsibility. What other investments have you made that could be of, of service, of heart, of your resources that have contributed to the success? I think that one has to um, go deep into maybe a country, into a culture, into a language um, in order to not only show the surface, but in order to show what's beyond the surface. So I'd say that for certain countries, I've really tried to, I mean, I've spent some time, I've learned the language, I've, I mean, I've learned Russian, and I've uh, uh, got acquainted with a lot of people, I've traveled there, I've kept those contacts, and I've gone deeper after a project, I've done another project and then another one, and. Each project somehow is the continuation or is, is a step beyond, you know, from the previous one. So I think that uh, going deep into something uh, is, is, is a great investment. Rather than do this and that and that and that and that and that, 
Um, so th that, th that is my response. I think it's so important to invest in your own personal experience of a culture to really understand it before you try and attempt to, to tell its story to any audience. So thank you for that. It's very clear that you've invested wisely and the fans and I appreciate it. Bertrand, please tell everyone where they can continue to find, follow and support you in your career. Just, I just wanted to, to add something to what I just said. Yes. Is that um, when I make a documentary film, but the same is true for fiction as well, it's a, a part of my life which, which I'm sharing. It's not, it's not just a film that I shoot and I edit and then I show it. Yeah. It's a part of my life because I meet with people, I live somewhere else, I learn the culture, I have, you know, it's a whole experience, a life experience. And, and it is a part of my life which I want to share with the viewers. So uh, this also has to do with the investment that you were talking about. It's a life investment. Absolutely. It's the investment in your life as an artist, truly, Yes. To, to share that. Well, thank you again. We appreciate you. Please, again, remind the fans where they can find, follow, and support you. Um, I mean, they can, uh, I have a website, you know, I have um, bertrandnorman.com. Uh, I can be contacted through my email address, bert uh, bertrandnorman at gmail.com. Uh, sometimes, I happen to organize crowdfunding campaigns sometimes. So we organize one for my latest project, which I finished just last Friday, which is a documentary about a, a, an opera singer who is also a rocker. Um, so they can write to me. That's probably the best. And I, I have a Facebook account, and I have a, a professional Facebook account, uh, which is like a Bertrand Norman Filmmaker. Wow. And I have an Instagram account. Perfect. Well, thank you again. Congratulations on the success of many of your films and, of course, the French Riviera Film Festival. We look forward to continuing to follow and celebrate you and your career. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Fans, keep it here. We've got another look at one of the incredible sizzles from the French Riviera Film Festival. Stay tuned. Welcome back, fans. Our next feature is with Christina Rose, the director and writer of Wonder Woman, a six-part documentary series. She is an American-German director, producer, and screenwriter, and is part of the New Hollywood Movement. She's also the co-founder of Mirror Water Entertainment and is joining us virtually live from Cannes now. Motorsports is dominated by men. Oh, I mean, a lot of industries are dominated by men. Why? I it's entertaining for me. You can tell they're expecting some you know, businessman, and they see me, and I think a lot of people are taken back by that. I was told by an orchestra that they had never had a woman conductor for as long as they could remember. The mission hasn't really changed from the beginning. The mission is to send the first female German astronaut into space. When people say, oh, I have it in my blood, no, I didn't have aviation in my blood, but I still reached and managed to be at a good level in my career. So. I think that the people have to go seeing that things are changing. The woman also has the same vision, the same capacity to confront what the man is facing. You know, a lot of times that it's okay, sometimes you're not good at things and it's completely okay. Some people will succeed and some will fail. And if you're failing at something, it's okay. It's okay to fail. It's easy to say to don't give up, but if you really experience it in life, then uh, it really pays off. I've been told by so many people that I couldn't do certain things, and it never is. You just gotta do it. And I knew very clearly that however long it was gonna take, I had to keep going. was incredible. I am so excited to welcome to the show Christina Rose, writer and director of Wonder Woman. Hi, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much for joining us virtually, of course, and congratulations. We know that you're a finalist of the French Riviera Film Festival. How do you feel? 
excited. I mean, this is such an honor to be selected as a finalist. So this is a great film festival and I hope people will enjoy the documentary. Tell us about the documentary from your point of view and what was your mission with it? So uh, this particular one is about a female conductor and unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize that uh, there's only a, a few female conductors in the whole world. So it's a very little representation. And so being able to um, show Tiani Lu and her experience and her journey into becoming a conductor, I think hopefully will inspire other women and girls out there who might not realize that they can do this to become conductors because we're really showing an insight look into uh, who she is and what she does. That is incredible. I'm very curious, who were the biggest inspirations or mentors to you, especially as female filmmakers? Well, it's, uh, it's an excellent question. I think one of my favorite fil female filmmakers, probably Jane Campion. I love the piano. I think that still to this day is timeless and classic and uh, says so much about uh, female representation and female storytelling in that sense. And uh, I think it's amazing. There's a lot in terms of filmmaking that I learned from her. So uh, she's definitely uh, my top choice. What would you say your thesis is, your statement as a director? So I would definitely say uh, I'm kind of the person who loves telling stories of the underdog. Um, people who um, have maybe the biggest challenges to face in their life and to be able to overcome them. Because I myself consider myself an underdog in my life. I've, I've had uh, many challenges that I had to face. So in that sense, um, those are the stories that have always inspired me. And I think th those are the stories that still need to be told because there are a lot out, of, out there to be told. Oh. You and me both, I have always been the biggest fan of the underdog. I always want to root for the <laughs> underdog. But unfortunately, I don't think you're the underdog in this competition, but I'm still rooting for you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Now, on FanVestor, we talk a lot about fans and investing. I'm wondering who and what are you a fan of that has influenced your work? You know, it's not just, um, I, I think for me, the beginning was stories. And I think I'm a huge fan in terms of biographies. I've always, even as a kid, loved reading biography, uh, biographies of all types of people. And I think uh, there are a lot of books that you might see that I have of just, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be just celebrities, but also your normal people who share their experience of what it is that they've overcome and what they've experienced. Because, you know, I even still today, I feel like I'm a small little kid and still learn so much from people that have experienced life uh, before me. Oh, I appreciate your authenticity in that. And what would you say is the best investment you've ever made? That could be an investment of your time, of your resources, of, of your heart. What would that be for you? Uh, that's another good question. I think in the end, I would probably say um, my education uh, in that sense was the best investment because that's an experience that I think is very unique. Um, it's one that I know my family members before me, like my mom and other people, didn't have that opportunity. But I learned so much. I mean, not just what it is that I studied, but the experience of simple, basic life lessons that I think uh, can't be experienced in any other way. So powerfully said. So please tell us what's next for you. Well, we're actually preparing for another documentary series called Ingenious with Lonnie Evans that focuses on innovations um, from maybe areas that you wouldn't think that they are um, inventing anything because we're looking basically at the problems of the 21st century and finding the answers to these problems, be it the wildfires on the West Coast or the water issues in Flint, Michigan. Um, and we're looking in, in areas like India, China, Argentina, places where they don't have electricity or where they've already been facing these problems years before what we are experiencing now. And they might just have the solutions uh, to these problems. So it's kind of very exciting for us to share. 
Well, Christina, I think you are a true Wonder Woman. If I do say so myself, please remind everyone where they can find, follow, and of course, catch your next projects. Absolutely. We have a website called mirrorwaterentertainment.com. We are also on Facebook as well as on Instagram, all with Mirror Water Entertainment. Oh, thank you so much. Best of luck to you tonight at the French Riviera Film Festival Award Ceremony. We'll talk soon. Thank you so very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Keep it here, fans, for the look at the next great sizzle from the French Riviera Film Festival. I say menage a trois, yeah, yeah. feature with Colin Costello, whose comedy from Russia with Motive is a finalist at the French Riviera Film Festival. WGA East member Colin Costello is a biracial genre comedy and horror writer, wrapped by Metallic Entertainment. The former award-winning advertising creative director has written two family feature films, 2013's Star Wars-influenced theatrical release, The Stream, which stands at a 93% at Rotten Tomatoes. Let's take a look at the sizzle. My name is Natasha, and I am from Russia. Meet Natasha. <laughs> oh, Alex! Shoot! Alex! Shoot! Shoot! No! Svetlana! My name is Svetlana Vladimirovna Lukanovich. Meet Svetlana. Natasha! <laughs> million dollar <laughs> Two sisters, one plan. Rich! What could possibly go wrong? Introducing From Russia with Motive, a new comedy about love, of money, Fish. Fish. <laughs> you had me at per necklace. Hey fans, welcome back to the Fan Buster Report. I am so excited to be here with one of the finalists from the French Riviera Film Festivals, Colin Costello, representing From Russia with Motiva. Hi, Colin. Oh. Hey, how's it going? Uh, we're so excited for you. How are you feeling today? Uh, really excited. I mean, it's a win to even be a finalist. So just make it, making it to that level in a film festival, given all the competition, you know, that's, I feel great. As you should. So tell us about the film from your perspective. Uh, well, From Russia with Motive is actually a web series. It's an eight episode web series um, about, you know, on the surface, it's about two uh, 
Russian sisters who flee their little village and they come to America, specifically Los Angeles, to find rich husbands. Um, it's kind of a parody of 90 Day Fiance where they have 90 days to marry each other. And what the sisters really find is, and that's what we explore in the series, really is a lot of stereotypes that we may have about Russian women. Uh, one of the creators, Charlotte Roy, is Latvian, so she falls into that whole stereotype category. And also stereotypes that they may have about Americans and everything and how we're really kind of all alike, even though we're from you know different areas of the world. You know, stereotypes play a great role in much of the social commentary throughout any web series or film. What stereotypes have you personally made it a mission to break through in your career? Oh, I mean, well, in my career, I'm biracial. So, uh, you know, and I came out of advertising and a lot of times just the way it was at the time, um, you know, you get pigeonholed. If you're a person of color, you get pigeonholed that you can only do uh, speak to black people or speak to brown people. And, uh, you know, had to work extra hard, uh, hard, harder than everyone else to prove that's just not the case. And then you move on somewhere new and it happens again. So you're constantly just really trying to prove yourself that, you know, you're not just this one dimension like you know my manager is african-american uh, metallic entertainment but you know um i don't really write per se black because that's not my truth that's not my upbringing i write comedy and superheroes and you know things like from russia with motive which you know i was really proud of that while the cast is pretty much all white, my crew was pretty much a brown crew and going all the way down to the editor. So I was really proud of that because if a brown crew can pull off a story about two Russian women, because you don't really get whiter than that, you know, we can pay, basically do anything. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing. And Fanfester, of course, we talk really? a lot about the fans. And I'm wondering who and what are you a fan of that's really influenced, you know, you as an artist and as a filmmaker? Oh, wow. God, so many. Um, well, right now, you know, I because I was a kid of the 80s. So growing up, it was always Spielberg, Spike Lee. I got to work with for a year and that was like being in film boot camp. Um, I, I got I have a lot of surprises that sound like lies, but they're the truth, like just experiences like having Michael Bay take me into like one of his edit bays and show me like behind the scenes of one of his films or having Maya Angelou cook lunch for you, you know. Um, so a, a lot of influences, a lot of influences from TV, uh, especially now, you know, Greg Berlanti with all the superhero stuff and, on DC and of course, obviously Kevin Feige and Marvel and just a lot, a lot of that, you know, just really a lot of am admiration and respect. It speaks so much of you, though, right? There's something so powerful yeah. about you uh, and your personality, your character, your persona, to be trusted in those scenarios with Michael Bay or with Maya Angelou. What, in your opinion, is it about, about you that has put you in that position? Because it's very <laughs> special. No, it, it, when I look back, I always go, you know what? When it's all said and done, I've had an interesting life. You um, have. I don't really know it, i i don't manifest it it's just thing i always had a dream since i was like five years old of making films and you know it, it's just it's been an unexpected journey just you know um yeah i can't i can't really say maybe open Maybe creative people seem to respect my creativity a lot, um, but I end up finding myself in situations where people want to work with me. Well, if I that don't think sense. that's lucky at all. <laughs> I think you are divinely purpose to do that. So, uh, you know, since you were five years old, looking all the way back, is there anything you wish you would have known about entertainment or Hollywood or filmmaking or life in general? That well, yeah, I mean, I don't know where you're from, but I'm from Philly and, you know, I went from Philly to New York, to Chicago to uh, here 
Uh, and the thing is, in Philly, you know, L.A. is so far away. Entertainment is so far away. I mean, you didn't have M. Night Shyamalan even growing up in Philly at that time, or even like, you know, Will Smith was just starting to come up. So entertainment is something that other people do. Like people in Philly get real jobs. You know, they, they, they go to work nine to six and they come home. People don't even talk about really moving away to New York because I always say New York is like 90 minutes and 10 years away from Philly and right. not to put it down because it's home. But it, that was kind of the attitude. It's a very provincial in a lot of ways when I was growing up. And it was just something that you just, it was just something that other people did, but it was just like, I was one of those weirdos that really wanted to do it. You know, I was the type that would, when we could do it, you know, spend like, go, go to the movies and spend like three times watching the movies, you know, st stay there and watch it over and over again, you know? Um, I can so yeah, it was always in me. I could be a storyteller. Well, I grew up in Michigan uh, and everyone oh, well, there said, you go. yeah, when are you going to get real or get a real job? And excuse me very much. This is a real job. <laughs> and it, no, is, it is a it real is my, job. Yeah, it is my and... reality, but it's so funny because it seemed worlds away. But, you know, even when I was a young girl, I was making talk shows in my girlfriend's basements and we'd use her, her dad's little VHS camera in the early 90s. And, you know, we created that reality. And in fact, you know, some could say that we invested in that destiny for yourself, whether that was watching a movie two or three times in the theater or, or, or me in, in that basement making my own show. You know, it, those were powerful investments. What else have you invested throughout no, your life? No, it's because your career. Yeah, I mean, and it's like it's an it's it's a natural investment you're making in yourself. And, you know, people, you know, people see like you look amazing right now on camera, but people don't see that this business that we're in entertainment, even when it comes to doing a web series, even when it comes to doing something like this, this is blue collar work. This is as hard, it's hard. You're like no. you come home from this tired, like you've been digging ditches all day. Like it's not glamorous. Like people see like the red carpet or they'll see the Beverly Hills, the celebration at the Beverly Hills later on. And that's great, that's the payoff, but they don't see how hard all the, arguments, all the figuring out how mentally taxing all of this is. No, I don't care how small the project is, it's taxing and it, it wears you out. It's And I just say, it's like, that's maybe that's it coming from Philly. I'm blue collar like that. Like, I want to just keep working, you know? I'm Michigan like that. Yeah. I yeah. I can maybe definitely that's... feel that. So what's next for you? Well, right now I am working with my manager. He's uh, pitching a couple of pilots for me. He's shopping those around right now. And I am now getting ready to work on a short film. It's kind of like my last short film because a lot of people feel like I should be directing episodic TV based on my other short films. So I'm doing one last short film and kind of another Twilight Zone type thing called Storage. Uh, you know, a lot of my films, even from Russia with Motive, a lot of them are female driven. I think it's because I have two daughters, Chloe and Max, and I always wanted to create like roles for them, especially when I was like a stage dad taking Max around auditions and everything. And, you know, so for some reason, I end up writing as a female a lot. I get paid to write as a female a lot. Um, and not to take away anything from women writers, go women writers. But yeah, you know, my, my films tend to be uh, female driven and explore like that psyche. So yeah, my next thing is going to be uh, storage as far as the short film independent stuff. And then, yeah, I'm constantly writing. I just finished, turned a feature script into a producer and uh, yeah, just, I juggle a lot. <laughs> it sounds like, and I'm very curious as a writer, when you experience writer's block, what do you do? Where do you go to for inspiration? Uh, that that sounds like um, one of my students at UCLA. Uh, I teach screenwriting there too. Um, there isn't writer's block. Okay. There, there just isn't. You 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 are in the you're in the entertainment business just like I am. We don't have the luxury of saying, "Oh, you know what? I don't feel like appearing on camera today." Yeah. Uh, 
I, I, I'm not feeling it. Maybe tomorrow when I'm in the mood. And it's the same as a writer. I don't have, I'm paid to be a writer. That's my job. You have to work through the writer's block. You have to write something down. You have to figure out something, even if it's crap. You still got to figure it out because you're being paid to do that. That's your job. And yeah, if it's a hobby, sure, put it down, come back two months later. But if we're really working at it, if you're really working at this, you don't have the luxury of writer's block, you know? I think that's true for anything in life. You know, one, yeah, step, that's one sentence is better than none. Don't wait for that moment of, you know, genius to strike or inspiration. You have to continue, put, put the pen well, to paper or the foot to the pavement and move forward. 1, 000. Yeah, 1,000 percent, because the fact of the matter is, I believe I, I never when I first started writing, I didn't think of this. But now that I do, because I meditate a lot and everything that when you think of an idea, oh, that would be a great story that, that you're an idiot. If you think you are the only person with that idea, there are like 25 to 30 other people with that same idea working on just as fast. And I think that uh, that idea is now a part of the universe and now it becomes a race to the finish line to see who can get it across first. Uh, well, I so can't I think, think as professionals, we don't have that luxury. Oh, you know? exactly. Well, I can't wait to see what other big ideas you have coming up next. Please remind the fans where uh, they continue to find and follow and support you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at colon underscore Francis underscore Costello and on Twitter at colon the writer one. Well, congratulations again. We look forward to seeing yeah, you. Thanks so much. The Vieira Film Festival. Stay well and take care. You take care. Bye now. Bye. Hey, fans, keep it here. We have more coming up on the Fanvesta Report. Next, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview with Anna Fishbein, whose film Invisible Alice is a finalist in the drama category of the French Riviera Film Festival. CBS Radio pronounced her a comic genius. Anna wrote and starred in the award-winning web series Happy Hour Feminism and directed and starred in Invisible Alice, a short musical film currently on the Film Fest circuit. Welcome to Express Travel. How may I help you? Uh, you'd like two flights to the Cayman Islands? Sure, I can help you with that. <laughs> А вы меня все заставляли идти в статистику, в математику, э, в физику я даже Гарвард. занималась. Никто не бросает для того, чтобы идти работать в экспресс тревел. Люди спросят меня, чем твоя дочь занимается. А что скажу, она в экспресс тревеле работает? Я им скажу, она у меня бизнес вумен. Я хотела быть певицей. Он был самый интересный, самый, самый красивый, самый уникальный человек, с которым я когда-нибудь не встречалась. И я его безумно, безумно, по-настоящему любила. И он мне дал лайло. Big daddy's on the beat. Bro, tell me where you been at. You been gone for a minute. I've been pushing to the limit. I'ma hit you when I finish. Nigga, I've been flying on the scale. Chain bigger than a midget. I've been getting money independent. Tell her, hey, the money been there. Tell her, hey, the money been there. Go and tell her, hey, the money been there. Money been there. Go and tell her, hey, the money been there. Why they can't money been there. Go and tell her, hey, the money been there. Don't be late, mommy. Yes, sir. 
это один из твоих идиотских мужчин из интернета? А скажи, а у него работа есть? Э, ты, послушай, ты сейчас, я надеюсь, находишь хотя бы мужчин с деньгами, а? fans that was a look at invisible alice and i'm so excited to be able to be here with writer director anna fishbein hi anna thanks so much for joining us and congratulations thank you so much thank you How i'm very excited to be here oh absolutely so you are one of the finalists at the french riviera film festival is this the first time you've participated yes it is it's the first time but yeah. you are no stranger to the film festival circuit i'm not <laughs> 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 yeah, so I've been I've been to a whole bunch of film festivals, so it's been really exciting. I've I was at the Cannes Film Festival before the pandemic, which was one of the highlights of my film festival experience. Uh, so. Absolutely, you know, earlier oh. in the show I had mentioned how many fans have FOMO, including me, because I'm just watching the social feeds from the French Riviera right now, and it looks so glamorous. Yes, it was incredible and lots of parties. And I screened uh, a film there um, called Galaxy 360, A Woman's Playground. And it was really exciting. It was the pre-release version of it. And it was amazing having people come to your movie and comment on your movie. So um, it's it's incredible. And I, I'm looking forward to the French Riviera Festival, which screens at the same time as the Cannes Film Festival. I'm looking forward to next year when we can all be together in person. Ah, bien sûr, on y va. I hope to be there. <laughs> I really, really do. You know, people who aren't in Hollywood or the entertainment industry might not recognize the importance of film festivals themselves. So from your perspective as a filmmaker, how valuable are those to really the business of film for you? Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I started out with a web series, uh, Happy Hour Feminism, and I never expected that web series to win anything or go anywhere. And as soon as I had it out and it was really funny and it started winning, like it started becoming a finalist and started getting nominated. So I was like, I really should go to these festivals. You know, I, I should really check this out. And so I went and it became this giant community. And later on, I ended up casting one of my actors in my feature film from having been at the October Film Festival um and just you know dps and people who are working on your film come from meet and greets and network so it's it's fabulous it's so true you know a lot of times yeah. people who are in la roll their eyes and say all you do is network well in the entertainment industry specifically your network is your net worth really and in putting yourself in those positions for opportunity and connection you can create some genius from that Exactly. And it is it is your work. Actually, you meet incredible people and you say to yourself, I can work with you. We can have fun together and create something beautiful and original. And so it's an amazing experience, actually. So um, CBS called you a comedic genius. Who can you attribute that to, Anna? Where oh, do you get your genius from? <laughs> oh, my my. I was going to say, um, I. So I come from a family where every, no one really followed their dreams, but really I was in a family of actors, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? and my Can mom, play. my mom, my mom, and my dad were both in very practical careers. And, you know, my mom was a dentist and my dad um, was in computer science, but we, we would like have these performances after dinner and we would dance and we would sing together as a family and my grandma would join in. And then my mom would do this thing where we would like improvise and imitate each other. And so uh, we would do these performances together and each person would imitate other people and we would all laugh. And so I learned literally improvisation and, <laughs> and comedy at the dinner table. And everybody was really like, no one took themselves too seriously, which I always say is the key thing in comedy. Which is a hilarious and the perfect tie into the pre-production for your next project, How to Seduce Your Dinner Guest. 
that is true. That is a pure comedy. It's full of misunderstandings and um, uh, really nasty people. So <laughs> well, nasty people are always funny to lampoon. Well, and but there's so much inspiration that takes place around a dinner table, whether that was from your childhood or your next project. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So tell us a, a little bit about Invisible Alice. Um, so Invisible Alice is a film that's close to my heart. Um, I made it because it was a personal story. So as I mentioned, nobody in my family followed their dream of being on stage, even though they were all dreaming of being on stage. And I was kind of the first one who did that. And I came out, my first show was called Conversations with My Breasts. And you can imagine how fun that was for my parents. Um, <laughs> and then my second show was called Sex in Mommyville. And that was even funner. <laughs> and I couldn't keep it, you know, a secret. I, that was out and about and I had reviews. And so my parents would go to see it. And this experience of being from an immigrant family um, and having to come to your parents and say, hey, I, I want to do this stuff that's, you know, is is risky and you know may or may not make it but you guys just have to believe in me and have faith and so invisible alice was inspired um by that concept of children and immigrant families and i had spoken to so many other immigrant kids from everywhere i'm a russian immigrant and i came here as a small child and so many other russian kids were following in their parents' careers and doing whatever the parents said they should do. And I kind of rebelled, but I rebelled after I had kids. And so in my story in Invisible Alice, this is the story of a single mom who decides to become a singer, like a, like a kind of a, an underground cabaret singer. And she wants, she wants to perform at night. And it's like this really cool thing that she's doing, but her mom doesn't know. And throughout the film, she keeps it a secret from her mom who keeps trying to get her to meet a man and get married and support her daughter and herself so that she's not running after this dream. And the and Alice, who keeps telling the mom, you know, I want to sing, mom. I used to sing. I want to sing. And so finally, that's the story about this clash in cultures and the story of being a single mom and the hardship of being a single mom. And, you know, it, it's a very melancholy film. It's, it's, but it's also, it also has a sense of humor a little bit because <laughs> I couldn't do it without that. <laughs> well, um, of course you're a comedic genius, but I think it's been mentioned oh several God, times. So sweet, so <laughs> of course, you know, we've mentioned several times in this interview that you were the one in your family to follow your dreams, similar to your character, Alice, who's following her dreams despite the wishes of her mother for a more grounded, practical approach to her life. And I think that's such an important topic of this conversation really is the pursuit of your dreams and you know, what allowed you that opportunity or why did you dedicate yourself to that? What investment did you make so that you could really continue that pursuit? Because it isn't easy. It isn't easy. And you, uh, you know, the first investors in your life are your family members and you're convincing everybody around you, including your own kids. Hey kids, I know you're only two and uh, six, but I am going to go on stage right now and you're going to wait for me, you know, <laughs> and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to, my mom is going to babysit you and you're going to be okay with this. And in a way you're investing in order to follow this dream you are actually first convincing everyone around you to support you. Um, and I didn't come from the environment, you know, I hear a lot of actors say, oh, my mom was my biggest cheerleader or my dad, or, you know, I had a teacher. I, I didn't really have any of that. Everybody was like, no, no, you know, you should, you're an intellectual, you're right. You should do this stuff and this is great for you. What are you doing? But then after my family saw me on stage, it was a different story. So the, everybody, everybody came on board after they saw me on stage that ah. first time. And, and that's that such was... an important point, though, because not everyone can be convinced until they see it and experience and witness it with their own eyes. And you clearly have convinced many people beyond just your family of your true meaning, <laughs> genius and art. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. It was, it was, uh, it took a lot of guts <laughs> to do that. You know, it took faith in, in oneself, but you know, I would, I had a lot of, um, kind of experiences where I would be with people and I would make jokes and people would be like, Oh, you should be an actress. You know, and I'd be like, Oh, 
Stop it. <laughs> Tell me more is what you really wanted. Keep, keep talking. You yeah. Know? <laughs> uh huh. Well, please tell the fans where they can find, follow, and continue to support your work. So, um, Anna Fishbein Official is my website. It's also my Facebook fan page. Uh, and you can follow me on Instagram on our, under Anna Fishbein. And then my, uh, I, I will say this, my feature film in uh my feature film, my first directorial debut of a feature film called Galaxy 360, A Woman's Playground, is going to be released this year. And I would love for people to follow that and follow me. And that is under Galaxy 360 Movie, both the website and the Instagram and the Facebook page. So uh, it would be great to have people come on board. And it's a really, really fun movie. And I will just say it here what it is. It takes place in 2195. Women rule the world. Men dream of getting married, and it takes place over a male beauty pageant. And oh. we encourage men. We encourage all the men to be hotter, thinner, younger. <laughs> That's our motto in the movie. <laughs> I cannot wait to see that. Well, thank you so much for your time, and congratulations again. We're rooting for you tonight at the French Riviera Film Festival. Take care. Thank you so much. Lovely interview. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Hey fans, keep it here for a look at the next great sizzle from the French Riviera Film Festival. Van Vester is home to the recent launch of Amari Stoudemire's latest venture, Masa, a new collagen product designed for those with an active lifestyle. Masa translates to journey in Hebrew, and the team at Van Vester is so excited to be on this journey together. Amari is a six-time NBA All-Star, Olympic bronze medalist, and most recently the 2020 MVP of the Israeli Championships. He's an entrepreneur with an organic farm, a clothing line, and even a series of children's books. Amari is a winemaker and the player development coach at the Brooklyn Nets. Fans, you are going to want to get in on these perks and experience. Buy Masa, and you could also get a limited edition Stoudemire hoodie. Have a one-on-one -on -one game of NBA 2K with Amari. Have a virtual round of boxing with Amari at Rumble Gym, dinner with Amari in New York, prepared by a personal chef, and the best perk, a trip to Israel with Amari, and he'll take you through a tour of the holy sites. Also now available on fanvestor.com, you can get hashtag hair dope, created by Super Dope Q. The hair color brand includes hair brightener, pre-shampoo, hair juice, and hair sauce. Hair color is hotter than ever, and most stylists even consider it to be a fashion accessory, more of part of your outfit and personal style. Hair Dope is inclusive to both wigs and natural hair with nourishing ingredients like olive oil, shea butter, argan oil, and keratin. The formula is water-based and free of salt, parabens, and ammonia. Even more, it's vegan and cruelty-free. And now that their hair is dope, fans can get in on perks and experiences. A purchase of the full Hair Dope set comes with a limited edition Super Dope Q hoodie. You can shop Q's closet or invest in a personal styling session on Zoom or a personal style session and makeover by Q in Atlanta. But the best perk? A trip to Black Ink Studio in Atlanta where you and your boo can get matching tattoos. Well, that's a wrap, fans, on Shark Week and the French Riviera Film Fest. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, don't forget to invest with heart and like, follow, and subscribe. We'll see you next time. We're all fans of something or someone. Investing our time and loyalty, but getting little in return. Well, it's about to change forever with Fanvester, a platform that lets you get in on celebrity businesses early on, buy shares of their new startups, support a charity and new product drops, and share once in a lifetime experiences with them. What's up, it's Amari Stoudemire here, and we're launching Masa with Fanvester to offer a limited edition perks, products, and experience to my fans. Here's how it works. Go to fanvester.com. Choose an opportunity you want to get in on. Click here and there, and you're done. Go check your email for the investor's certificate. And don't forget to check back often for updates on your new business investment. It's official now. Celebrate your support with an experience. Go 10 rounds in the gym with Amare. Get a matching tattoo with Super Dope Q. Or get on FaceTime and hang out by the pool with DJ Khaled. After all, you're more than a fan now. You're a fan investor.